This is a video for Finance 438, Management of Financial Institutions at California State University, Northridge, and I'm Jim Dow. This video covers Chapter 15 on the regulation of commercial banks. We will look at why we regulate banks, the basic principles of how we regulate banks, and then we'll look at specific uh, regulations. So why are banks regulated? Banking is an important industry, but there are a lot of important industries. So there's a question of why regulation plays such a significant role in the banking industry. There are several reasons for this. The first is the need for consumer protection, as banking products can be very complicated for the layperson. People have a much better understanding of what matters when choosing groceries than choosing a mortgage. So one of the focuses of bank regulation is to make products more understandable to individuals and restrict what terms banks can offer in their loans. Another problem with banks is that their primary asset, loans, are illiquid. As we'll see, if everyone tries to withdraw their deposits from a bank at once, it won't have enough cash on hand to meet this demand, because the money is tied up with loans. We call this a problem of illiquidity. Another difficulty is that problems at one bank can spread to affect other banks. So a few bad banks can put the entire banking system at risk. We call this systemic risk, and we'll see how this can result in a banking panic. Finally, because the government backs up the banking system, banks may be tempted to take advantage of that support, and so the government may restrict what banks can do. We need to distinguish between two different problems a bank can have. Let's start with a bank that has $90 of deposits and $10 of equity capital and $95 of illiquid loans and $5 of liquid assets. Say that the economy enters a recession and the value of its loans falls to 90. The total value of the bank's assets is $95, so the value of the bank's equity capital falls to $5. Notice that the bank still has enough assets to cover all of its depositors. The equity capital provides a cushion if the value of the bank's assets fall. Now let's say the value of the bank's loans fell to $80. Note that the total value of the bank's assets is $85 and is less than the value of its liabilities. It doesn't have assets to cover all of the depositors. When this happens, we say that the bank is insolvent. The bank might be able to meet short-term cash flow needs such as paying interest on deposits, but it doesn't have enough assets to return the depositors all their money in the long run. That bank needs to be recapitalized, that is, investors putting in more equity capital, or it will fail. One of the purposes of bank regulation is to make sure that banks have enough capital that they don't become insolvent. If depositors think that a bank might become insolvent, they will likely try to pull their money out of the bank. If only a few depositors do this, say they try to pull $5 out of the bank, the bank is okay since it has $5 of liquid assets it can use to pay off the depositors. However, say that the depositors want to pull out $20 out of the bank. Now the bank is in trouble. It only has $5 immediately available. We say that the bank is illiquid. it will have to tell the depositors that they can't pull out the money right then, and then it will have to raise the money the best it can. Maybe it could sell the loans to another bank, although this isn't that practical since it would take a lot of time, and they wouldn't be able to get the full value of the loan. When everybody goes to a bank to pull out their deposits, we call this a run on the bank, or a bank run. Bank runs can happen even with a healthy bank. Say that I think the bank is solvent. It has more assets than liabilities. And I also think that no one is going to take their money out of the bank. Then I'm fine with leaving my money in the bank. However, if I think a bunch of other depositors are going to pull their money out of the bank, then I'm concerned. If they pull out their money and I don't, then maybe the bank will become illiquid and fail, and so I won't get all my money back. Because of this, I'll rush to the bank so that I'll be first in line to get my money back. 
If everybody does this, we have a bank run, which itself might cause the bank to fail, even if it's solvent. It's the expectations of a bank run that causes the bank run. There are various regulations designed to provide banks with liquidity and prevent bank runs that might cause otherwise healthy banks to fail. This could be done by the government temporarily lending a bank money so that it could pay off the depositors. Another way of solving this problem is by providing deposit insurance. With deposit insurance, the government guarantees my money at least up to some amount. In this case, I know that I will get my money back even if the bank fails. And because of that, there's no reason to go to the bank to withdraw my money just in case. I know I'll get my money back anyway. Since all the depositors don't need to pull out their money, we don't see a bank run. In the absence of deposit insurance, we saw how the expectation of a run on a bank can lead to an actual bank run. What we've also seen in history is if there's a run on one bank, this will lead depositors at other banks to become concerned and, to, and lead to a bank run at those banks. A bank run can spread across the banking system. This is called contagion. So the failure of one bank can lead to a general bank panic that could disrupt the entire banking system. We call this systemic risk. It might be acceptable to let one bank fail on its own, but if one bank failure can cause the entire system to fail, then we need to be concerned about every bank. While we have a number of regulations in place to prevent bank panics now, we saw in the 2008 banking crisis that there were other types of financial institutions that had a similar problem, where their assets were longer term and less liquid than their liabilities. In addition, we saw that healthy financial institutions were dependent on investments in unhealthy institutions, so that the failure of one financial institution could lead to the failure of others. Because of this, the government chose to step in and support certain failed institutions if they were large enough that their failure would undermine the entire financial system. This doctrine became known as too big to fail. These actions stopped the financial crisis from becoming worse at the time, but might lead to problems later. We'll look at this in a later video. To understand where we are now, it's useful to know a little bit of banking history. For a long time in the U.S., banks were restricted in their ability to offer services in more than one state, and in some states were even restricted in the number of branches they had. This led to the banking system being characterized by a large number of small banks. On the other hand, there was little in the way of uh, regulation protecting banks, such as deposit insurance. Because of this, banking panics were not uncommon. When the Great Depression hit, we saw a classic bank panic, where depositors tried to get their money out of the bank, and the panic quickly spread across the banking system. The president declared a bank holiday, in which all the banks in the country were shut down. Many of them never reopened. Because of this, new banking regulations were made to reduce the likelihood of a bank panic. Most importantly, the Banking Acts of 1933, known as Glass-Steagall, in 1935. These acts put a ceiling on the interest rate that banks could offer on deposits, with the idea of reducing competition across banks to offer higher deposits, which would increase their cost. The regulation also separated commercial banking and investment banking activity. Before, a bank could take deposits and make loans, commercial banking, and also trade securities and hold equity, which is part of investment banking. It was thought that investment banking activities were riskier. So banks were split into commercial banks, which were protected, highly regulated, and limited in what they could do, and investment banks, which were less regulated but couldn't take deposits. Also, deposit insurance was introduced to prevent bank runs. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, was established to provide this insurance, and it became a major bank regulator. The Federal Reserve was established in 1913 and so existed during the Great Depression, 
was thought, but was thought to be too passive when it happened. After this, there was a much better understanding of what the Federal Reserve should do in a crisis, and we saw a much more effective and active Federal Reserve during the 2008 financial crisis and during the coronavirus crisis. Since then, we've seen a number of different changes in bank regulation. I'll focus on some of the more important ones. The Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 represented an increase in the focus on consumer protection in banking regulation. It requires banks to make loans across all areas of the community, including poorer areas. We also saw a relaxation of some of the past regulations. The Regal Neal Act removed restrictions on interstate banking, and as a result, we saw a wave of bank cons consolidation. The interest rate ceiling on deposits was removed, as was the strict separation of commercial banks and investment banks. During and after the 2008 financial crisis, we saw an increase in regulation and government intervention in financial markets. TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, authorized the U.S. Treasury to purchase certain financial assets to support the market and the institutions that own the assets. The Dodd-Frank Act was a group of regulations designed to reduce the risk of a financial crisis in the future. Notably, it increased consumer protection regulation by establishing the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection and, through what was known as the Volcker Rule, placed restrictions on a bank's use of derivative securities. Even with all the regulation, it can still happen that a bank's assets can fall in value enough to make the bank insolvent, which will force the regulators to step in and take over the bank. There are two basic ways this is handled. In the payoff and liquidate approach, the assets of the failed bank are liquidated, sold off or collected, and the depositors are paid off up to the value of the deposit insurance. If there are additional funds after that, additional depositors or other lenders may be paid. However, often the assets will have more value if they are kept intact and not liquidated. While some of the loans are bad, which is why the bank uh, is insolvent, other loans may still be good and will be repaid. In this case, the regulators will take a purchase and assumption approach. The good assets are kept with the bank, and another bank takes over the failed bank. The bank continues as an ongoing business, and the deposits retain their value. The purchasing bank will need to recapitalize the purchase bank to make it solvent. The regulator, generally the FDIC, may provide some financial assistance to the purchaser bank to sweeten the deal. That's because it'd be cheaper for the FDIC to provide some assistance than to take over the bank and pay off the depositors itself. <laughs> 